hello, my name is Ray Naylor and this is the 13th episode of The Performing Songwriter. Uh, my guest today describes herself as a professional smart, smart aleck. Uh, she is primarily known for her humorous songs about topics such as wedgies, Waffle House, and Klingons. In 2002, my guest suffered two strokes and kidney failure, not to be outdone by these serious health problems. She relearned guitar and released a CD uh, at that time called Sick Humor. All in all, my guest has released four CDs and other recordings, has performed all over the country and in the UK, has played on many radio stations, and has received many awards, too many to list here. My guest today, Carla Albrecht. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. How are you doing? Really well, thanks. Um, I was going to ask you to talk a little bit about uh, how long you've been writing songs and how long you've been performing. Well, I have been writing songs for as long as I can remember. When I was little, I was either, you know, always parodying a song or just making up little ditties. But I started really writing songs my last year of high school, like original songs. And I didn't perform for anybody. I had horrible stage fright. It's probably all that classical training that just makes you afraid to play a single note lest your hand position go out of line. So I actually did not have the courage to get on stage until I got sick and almost died. And then the whole stage fright thing seemed kind of silly. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that's when I started performing. It was the first time I got sick, and that was 1994. So I, uh, gosh, 20 years then. So right. that I've been performing my own songs. Okay, let's hear one of your songs. Okay, I this one, this one I wrote during that second episode <laughs> with the kidney failure in Brooks. Oh, oh, over and over, I make an appointment with you. Over and over. Not sure what to do. Ooh, over and over, you refer me to somebody new. So, oh, oh, over and over, I'm sitting in the waiting room. I met the radiologist, immunologist, oncologist, pathologist, psychologist, neurologist. They really need some new magazines in here. So over and over, wish I'd brought something to do, cause I'm here over and over, sitting in the waiting room. I met the ophthalmologist, pulmonologist, rheumatologist, hematologist, nephrologist, cardiologist, he didn't even listen to my heart. through over and over you tell them that it just won't do I told them over and over I'm not sitting here like a fool so they took me oh, 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 over to another waiting room I'm at the gastroenterologist nurse I waited for two hours And then I saw him walk into his car Office hours were over They were over I knew what I had to do I ran him over And over Left him in the waiting room Boy, isn't that true? <laughs> You know, as I get older, I, I, I'm, I have to filter what I tell the doctor. Otherwise, oh, we'll do this test, which means another copay, you know? Yeah. So. And we'll put you on this med and that med and that med to make your numbers look better. <laughs> exactly. Um, our uh, songwriting topic today is writing 
funny songs, which obviously you do. And I want to ask you about, in, uh, uh, in terms of the songwriting part, uh, like in terms of song structure or anything really, uh, what do you, what do you do? What's your process for writing a funny song? Well, there are two different processes. One is a process for writing parody. Like that's a parody mm -hmm. I stole, stole and borrowed the music, repurposed, recycled, mm -hmm. uh, no waste. I'm an ecological songwriter. Uh, the music from Lloyd Price's Personality. Uh, right. And that is a different process. I map that and I try to match the the sounds and the rhyme structure exactly if I can. Mm -hmm. And so what I have is like on the left side of the page I'll have the original lyrics and then on the right side of the page I'll work on my lyrics so that I don't get too far off the base because otherwise it, it has to be a funny idea and it has to pretty closely match the original mm -hmm. song. So there's right. like a double layer with the parodies. It's actually kind of a restrictive mm -hmm. song to if you're gonna do it properly it's sort of a restrictive song form. Whereas if you write an original song, now you're free to do you know, verse chorus, verse chorus, verse chorus, bridge chorus, whatever. Or sometimes I just do a snippet when mm -hmm. I realize that the song idea is it's funny for four lines, but that's it. So I have a lot of those. I have mm -hmm. a lot of things that are just like one verse because the idea does it doesn't bear three minutes worth of exploration. <laughs> but in general, I have I, there, there has to be an idea and there has to be something behind it that it's something that's on my mind that I either I either find amusing or annoying or uh, infuriating so it has to be worth my effort to write about it I have to really have a an emotion about it this is me it's not everybody's process but for me if I'm gonna put the effort into making it a proper song that bears listening to over and over again then I have to feel something about mm -hmm. it right. and I think that's important for the audience as well that it's not just fluff. No, mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with fluff because it's, it's, laughter is just great, you know. And that's my short songs are usually fluff. They're just <laughs> silly. The little short snippet ones are like, okay, this is fluff. I, I like fluff songs too. But the the longer ones, I do tend it tends to be a topic that I really want to explore because it's something that I haven't been able to put into words. Mm -hmm. And the song form is, gives me enough structure and everything to where I can take something that's really bothered me and express it in really clearly and where people might I know I've done it right when people come up to me and go that is so true mm -hmm. yeah know? exactly um, I was watching one of your uh, YouTube videos where you were performing and you were actually before you sang the song you're really doing stand-up and I wanted to ask you uh, there's certain techniques in, in comedy and stand-up or whatever uh, such as exaggeration which I use a lot and do you find you s yourself using those type of uh, comedy techniques as you're writing songs? Or I guess so. I, I don't sit there and consciously do it. Uh -huh. uh, there are, I guess, the left brain and the right brain approach. But I, I do think I, I do use, if I go, I go, go back and analyze what I've done, mm -hmm. and exaggeration is one of the most fun ways to just make something so ridiculous right. that it's now funny. And certainly with my, the material I was doing about being sick, that whole album called Sick Humor that's all medical humor, that was a really helpful way for me to talk about topics that were not funny at the time. Right. But if I just exaggerate it, and you know, obviously I did not, maybe it's not obvious, but I, I did not go out and run over my doctor <laughs> with my car over right. and over. I didn't have to because I was able to vent through my song mm -hmm, instead mm -hmm. of venting through my car right. <laughs> and actions. But unfortunately, there was someone named Carla who ran over her husband who was a doctor or a dentist in Texas. Like She ran over him like 12 times or oh, something geez. and then said it was an accident <laughs> 12 times. So I was like, that wasn't me. <laughs> but yeah, exaggeration is a really fun one. And play on words. A word play is great too. I share a lot of humor on Facebook, and I've found that 
what I'm learning is avoid political stuff. <laughs> That's probably obvious. And one of the things that splits people is when you do sexist humor, when you talk about how dumb your husband is or how, <laughs> you know, or yeah. how much this spouse hates their spouse, or whatever. It's it's negative. Um, but there is a way to do man woman humor that's that doesn't tear either party down. So I've been trying to play nice, which is what I try to do in my songs, play nice. Self deprecating is always mm -hmm. the safest way to go. Mm -hmm. And making fun of a group you belong to, like I can make fun of the South. Mm -hmm. I'm from the South. I can make fun of Jersey because I live there now. Right. I was going to ask you have you written any songs about Jersey? I haven't written any songs yet. No, I've been <laughs> doing some stand up about. Being a transplant, mm -hmm. li being from South Carolina and living in New Jersey, and it was a big adjustment. So. Well, I like to do a, my song uh, right. here. Great. And I haven't actually done this a little bit, so I had to practice it. And I always have an excuse for get, forgetting my words. It was Willie the Bipolar Polar Bear. This is a song about Willie. Bipolar polar bear He was big and impressive But a manic depressive Sometimes the others would stare When he was high He seemed to fly When down carried a frown He just needed someone to care That bipolar polar bear Now when he was manic Family would panic cause they wouldn't know what he'd do He'd catch fish all day then he'd throw them away Or make up some glacier stew He rearranged ice blocks, tried to chase sunspots Caught penguins all day till they fly He never got lazy but he sometimes got crazy And the other bears would Why do you act that way? Willie, Willie, we don't know what to say. Now when he got sad, he never got bad. He just laid around all day like a stone. If his friends came to play, he'd say, not today. I'd rather just be all alone. He hardly could eat. Get on his feet, thought about running away. Where would he go through the ice and the snow? Would he bear one more polar bear day? Oh, Willie, Willie, why do you seem so blue? Willie, Willie, we don't know what to do. Yes, this was a song about Willie, the bipolar polar bear. He was big and impressive, but a manic depressive, and somehow the others would stare. Well, when he was high, he seemed to fly, when down he carried a frown. He just needed someone to care, Willie that bipolar. Needed someone to care, Willie that polar bear. So I try to be, you know, humorous at the same time, uh, kind of tell a, a story uh, in terms of what it is I used to work in mental health. And, oh, okay. So, and when you work in mental health, you have your own mental health problems. <laughs> One, and as I'm listening to you, uh, reminded me of something that Bob Frankie said to me mm -hmm. once in a songwriting workshop. He said, when you do funny songs, you absolutely must do perfect rhymes. You can get away with imperfect rhymes or slant rhymes, as they call them, like rhyming home and alone. Mm -hmm. It's right. not really a rhyme, but it's close. It's a sound alike. Right. But with, with funny songs, for whatever reason, it has to be perfect rhymes. 
or it sticks out and, mm-hmm. and, and you're like, eh, like, <laughs> you didn't nail it. Yeah. And you had a very perfect rhyme scheme with that and, and unusual rhymes like depressive and impressive and manic and panic. You had unusual rhymes that were also perfect. And rhyming hits some little part of the brain that other things don't, which is probably why we use it with children so much. Mm-hmm. And why Dr. Seuss is so hugely popular. And you just want to hear it over and over again. And music, as we know, also hits parts of the brain that uh, other things can't access. And when you have people with memory problems, like my father has maybe Alzheimer's, but you never know for mm-hmm. sure until the autopsy, which we'd rather not do while he's still alive. But uh, he. You know, you put on music and it brings them back into the present, especially if it's older music that they remember from their youth. And they've shown this with a lot of patients that perk them up. Yeah, I used to, I worked in a psych hospital for a couple of years and we had two units. I worked in the women's unit. We had a, a, um, a unit for uh, women that were psychotic at that while they're in the hospital. And so sometimes I take my guitar and do like home and arrange or whatever. And I, I happened to say, I'm going to do an original song, and I did that song. And there was a, one of the women who, the whole time, she didn't sing, she just had her head down like this. So I started singing that song, and she started laughing. And I think that might have been the only time she laughed while she was in the hospital, wow. you know. So that was kind of cool. Yeah, that's a real gift. When I mean, you make it a polar bear, too, it's not, it's so ridiculous. Right? <laughs> right. That you're not talking about anybody in the room. Yeah, exactly. Like you removed the target to make it something that's easier to laugh at. Yeah. We're going to do our Skype interview now. Okay. And it's great. Uh, Honor Fennigan, Love who her. you know, and I you played at some of her gigs, you were telling me. Yes, we have shared a couple. Co-gigs, of, I should say. Yes, we've shared the bill, and she is wonderful. She has a great voice, and she's one of those people who can do a serious song and a funny song, and they're equally good. Yeah. I admire her. Okay, so we're going to listen to that, and we will be back. Uh, Honor yeah. Finnegan is the Susan Boyle of quirky indie folk, only hotter. Her songs are humorous, then heartbreaking with melodies that soar. Based in New York City, she has been making a splash in the northeastern regional folk scene with her original songs and ukulele playing. Combining elements of musical theory, comedy, and traditional folk and uh, poetry. Uh, Honor, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm, I'm excellent. Thanks for uh, being my guest today. Sure. It's my pleasure. Fun, um, fun, fun. I'm going to ask you just to talk a little bit about how long you've been songwriting and performing. Well, you've been performing been a long performing, time. Huh? You've been performing since you were I've been dead. performing since I was a little girl. Uh, when I was about 11 years old, I got my first professional job in theater at the Goodman Theater in Chicago. And then I did the first national tour of Annie not too long after that. Mm-hmm. I did a lot of improv as a young adult in, in Chicago with Del Close and Sharna Halpern. And then I moved to Ireland as a in my mid-20s. And I did a lot of singing there, blues, jazz, traditional Irish. And that's where I started songwriting. Um, And uh, I kind of did it in fits and starts. I wasn't a devoted writer. I I mean, it's a, I think it's a really intimidating thing, you know, being a beginning writer. And uh, it took me a while to sort of build my confidence. But um, I think I've been writing more seriously in the last couple of years. Yeah. So I did like one CD of original, oh, it was actually a cassette when there were still, yeah, right. that was still an option. <laughs> so it was a cassette of original material, and then I did a CD of original material, and then it was my third CD um, where I really, because actually with both of those first two adventures, I really didn't do much with it. It's like I recorded it, and then I kind of did other things in life. I didn't like pursue music. I was... Um, I was being a mom and I went back to school and different things like that. So it was with the third one that I really thought I wanted to do music again. And um, so that's the tiny life. And that's been in the last two years. Okay. Um, we were, we we're going to talk about both some songwriting uh, topics as well as performing. Okay. And um, uh, you write, uh, you write both, 
funny songs as well, serious songs. So I want to ask you, do you find in terms of the songwriting craft that you write them and it, are there any different approaches based on uh, the type of song it is? Well, um, I do. In your original question, there was something like, is funny stuff harder to write? And I think, yes, it uh -huh. is. Uh -huh. um, like, I would say in general, my process is a great percent of inspiration and not um, a lot of sweat. It's not that I don't work hard. I, I tend to write a lot when I am writing. So um, there's usually a good quantity of writing, but I don't usually labor over something with a lot of rewriting. Mm -hmm. So um, in general, my work uh, is like that. Usually, um, though, there with the funny stuff, it is a little harder. Um, I'll get... But I think if you have a good idea, a good solid idea is the main thing that you need. So like sometimes I'll have an idea and it's not an, it's not solid enough to give me a whole song, at least not the way that I write, you know. And I'm not sure. Am I answering your question? <laughs> You know, it's such a mysterious process. I mean, like, you, I only analyze it after the fact. Usually while I'm doing it, it is kind of like I'm in the zone, you know. I'm not, I'm not thinking too much about what I'm doing. It's like, um, it's like a puzzle, and I get a good, strong idea, and I'll have certain things, and then it's like I need to figure out, like, where the pieces mm -hmm. go in the puzzle, but it's sort of already there. I just have to fill in the pieces and figure it out. That's when I know I'm really on to something that's likely to be a keeper. Uh -huh. But you have to write a lot of non-keepers, I think, to get keepers, you know? Like, it's just, like, part of the process, I think. You find some of the songwriting techniques, are they pretty much the same regarding the topic of the song, would you say? How do you mean? Well, no, in other words, uh, are, uh, something like, for example, song structure. Um, do you use different structures for like a funny song versus a serious song? Are the rhyming schemes a little different or do you find it pretty much the same? Well, I do use a lot of wordplay in my funny stuff more than in my serious stuff. Mm -hmm. Or the way that I'm playing with words in my funny stuff is like really obvious. Whereas um, <clears throat> sometimes in the serious stuff, <clears throat> I mean, you're you're playing with the sound of words and the meaning of words and how they all fit together, but it's not as sort of obvious. And <clears throat> in terms of structure, I feel like the structure sort of presents itself like that's what the 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 puzzle is. It's like the structure is sort of there already. And I just have to figure out how it fits, how what needs to go in. So it's like, I feel like I know I have a song when the structure is kind of obvious to me. And I just have to figure out how to make it grow, how to make keep it interesting. And with the exception of like certain things, like endings can be tricky in terms of endings could be atypical. They don't all have to follow the structure, I feel like, okay. you know, so... Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes structure isn't so much of an issue, but to be honest, those songs that aren't highly structured are songs that I don't play out as much. It's not that I don't think they're interesting pieces or whatever. It's just that in terms of like reaching a crowd, it does help if you have a clear structure, you know, um, but, uh, I don't know if I answered the question. You did. Yeah, you did. I'm going to have you do a song, and by the way, even though we're talking about uh, comedy songs today, you don't need to do that. When you sing any song that you want to sing. Well, I thought I would do uh, something for my upcoming CD, which is called Roses and Victory, and I'm if I can do a plug, I'm doing an Indiegogo campaign right now for okay. it, um, and uh, this is going to be on it. I love a scallion pancake, shrimp toast and egg foo young, chow down on kung pao chicken, crab rangoon and dim sum. But when I'm saturated and when the meal is done, although I'm educated, 
complicated. It's more than just some fun. Remove the dishes, bring the check. It was delicious. Fortune cookie, fortune cookie, fortune cookie. Tell me what you see. I don't have a predilection for your crunchy sweet confection. I don't want to learn Chinese. Lucky numbers only for me. Please. I'm looking for that someone who will fulfill my dreams. It may be adolescent. I know there's no Prince Charming, but there can't be any harm in fortune cookie, fortune cookie, fortune cookie. Maybe there's a recipe. Maybe I should learn to read Chinese. Hoping there's a clue inside, so please don't tease and please don't try to placate with a platitude. Being nondescript and vague is just rude. Like enjoy yourself while you can. Believe in miracles. Could you be more specific? The date and minute of our rendezvous would be terrific. Fortune cookie, fortune cookie, fortune cookie. Maybe you don't understand. I am looking for a single man. Someone with a little gray who has a job and isn't gay. Someone who will give a damn. Not another wham bam. Thank you, ma'am. Give me a name and number, at least a neighborhood, and then I will surrender my heart, my body, and soul, and my need to be in control. Fortune cookie, fortune cookie, fortune cookie, tell me what you see. Fortune cookie, fortune cookie, please. Some of the chords were a little funny there. <laughs> oh, that's great. So, I, one of the things I liked about that, in addition to just I like the song, is that you use fortune cookie as opposed to a psychic. It, you know, uh, in terms of pre predicting or whatever you want to call it, you know what I mean? Well, I was having Chinese food with a songwriter friend, and I was like, I should write a song that goes, fortune cookie, fortune cookie. <laughs> and I started improvising, just riffing on that, and whatever it was, I really liked it, but I couldn't remember it later, so this was what I wrote later, but yeah. I like fortune cookies, and I do actually, I mean, I do believe it's easier to write about stuff that has truth in it. I mean, like, I do look for clues sometimes <laughs> in uh, funny places. <laughs> um, I, I, I wanted to mention, I forgot previously, um, you were a winner at Kerrville, was that correct? Yeah, two th 2013. So, um, and that's pretty prestigious for, uh, prestigious, whatever. <laughs> yeah, it is. That. It feels good. <laughs> yeah, it feels real good. Um, it's and that's... Like Go ahead. You're a real writer. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about performing funny songs. Um, okay. And, um, you know, I sent these questions ahead of time, so I'm just going to let, let you say what you've been thinking about that. About performing? Yeah. Uh, funny songs. Any difference? In, uh, well, I think know? timing, you know, it's like um, I have certain songs like where, say, in the intro of the song, I'm going to be sure not to give away the punch, what's basically the punchline of the mm -hmm. song. Right. And um, also like the delivery, I've tried it a little bit, a few different ways and it, it goes better if it's sort of deadpan and they don't necessarily, you know, I, ju I just do it very serious because it's, the humor is there in that, in that. Um, and then there's others where it's sort of like the more emotive I am, the funnier it is, you know, like m making facial expressions and um, really like hamming it up. Um, so it depends on the song and it's a pleasure to make people laugh for sure. You know what I mean? Like it always feels really nice. Um, and I always feel a little bad when someone says, I mean, of course it's a compliment. If somebody says, wow, that made me cry or something <laughs> like that with the serious things, because, you know, I don't know if it's cause I'm the youngest in the family or whatever, but I always sort of feel it's my job to sort of cheer people up. So I, um, I do write serious stuff, and I definitely, 
probably out of all the material I've written, there's probably more serious stuff than funny stuff, but partly because of what you said, which is I just think like they're rare, they are rarer gems in terms of good ones, Mm -hmm. of funny. And, but it's such a crowd pleasing thing and it's so, um, it's good for me and it's good for them. It's a win-win situation. It seems to me that you have to also be a, a very good reader of your audience. Who, who is your audience? In case you have some songs that you may not want to sing in front of some some audience, you know what I mean? Well, there, you know, it's like I only, I really only have like a handful of funny songs, like unlike Carla, whose, you know, body of work is, mm-hmm. you know. And so like I almost always do them. There's one song where I have wondered, is this the right crowd or whatever? And I can't always tell because sometimes you think, yeah, this is not the right crowd, but I just feel like doing it anyway, and people like it. And sometimes you think they'll like it, and it's kind of quiet. And sometimes it's quiet, and later people say, I really like that. So it's hard to tell entirely about some songs because they're not straight ahead. Like, you know where the laugh is going to be. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Right, right. So if it's if it's a song that's sort of humorous, but not necessarily, you know, or there's the, the one song that I'm thinking of, it's like, Usually there's like a few women, it's about relationships, who are like cracking up during that song. And other people are sort of smiling. So Mm. it's not a song that I expect the faz on, but it's still, um, you know, yeah, it's hard to know, I suppose. But I think like I I did a lot of improv and I I know a few stand-up comics and I think like, you know, you read your audience to a certain degree and then to another degree, it's like you kind of do what you do and uh-huh. people either like it or don't like it, right? Uh-huh. So um, there are certain things that I that I just always do because they're my strongest ones. And I don't know if there are people who don't like it. Mostly people seem to like it. I'm sure there's somebody out there who doesn't like it, you know, but they don't come up to me later and say, I didn't like it, you know, mm-hmm. so I, I don't really know. But um, uh I think you've got to be a good reader of audience no matter what you do, actually, because I love uh, heavy writers like, I won't name names because maybe, I don't know, but like Mary Gaucher or somebody like that. Um, She's very funny between her songs, you know, I think. She's very clever. She's very engaging. I mean, I would almost say whimsical for someone who's so down to earth and kind of hard hitting. Uh Um, I think that's a great uh, skill, you know, I, and, uh, and I think like a good performer, no matter what kind of material they know, they, I would say a good singer songwriter makes the audience laugh. A good performing singer songwriter makes the audience laugh at least once in the set. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If not their songs, their talk, you know, Mm -hmm. because it's a really natural way to, um, connect with people. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have you do another uh, song here. Okay. I'm not sure if I should do... uh, I think I'll do this romantic song. It's the title track for my uh, upcoming CD, which is called Roses and Victory. I can hear the ocean, I can hear the ocean. Hey, brushed my skin and said, You smell like roses and victory, roses and victory. Oh, that's how it's going to be. Roses and victory for you and me. When my last crust of bread is all gone and my song is right, will you love me? Will we fight when the sea has gone out and my boat won't come in? Will you care? Will you swim? Will you be there? Will you bring me roses and victory? Hey, makes fine art and 
princess I believe in, I believe in this and victory oh that's how it's gonna be roses and victory oh babe for you and me when my last crust of bread is all gone and my song isn't right will you love me will we fight when the sea has gone out and my boat won't come in will you care swim will you be there will you bring me roses and victory Pretty song, and uh, well, well written. Thanks. Um, I'm going to ask you how people can, uh, you know, find out where you're playing, uh, where to buy your music, but also I know you're in the process of uh, uh, getting ready, for, I guess, for another CD, and you're raising some money for that. If you could talk about that and how people can uh, help you in that way. Sure. I mean, I'm on Facebook and Twitter. I have a website, which is www.honorfinnegan.com. Um, that's H-O-N-O-R-F-I-N-N-E-G-A-N. And I'm doing an Indiegogo campaign right now. If you go to Indiegogo, it's Honor Finnegan, Roses and Victory. Um, and I'm opening for Peter Yarrow this Friday <laughs> at um, Outpost in the Burbs. So I'm psyched about that. And if you don't mind, I'd like to do one more song before we go. go ahead. Can go ahead. I? Okay. And you can decide what song, I suppose. But um, it's my holiday song, and I don't get to do it that often. Okay. <laughs> buy a lot of junk, buy a lot of junk, buy a lot of junk. It's Jesus' birthday, buy a lot of junk, buy a lot of junk, buy a lot of junk. It's Jesus' birthday, brand new jeans with rhinestones, playstations, and iPhones. Up boots, 200 a pair, Victoria's underwear, you can buy it all on credit, charge your card up to the limit, you can UPS, Federal Express, pack it in your trunk, buy a lot of junk. It's Jesus' birthday, eat a lot of crap, eat a lot of crap, eat a lot of crap. It's Jesus' birthday, eat a lot of crap, eat a lot of crap, eat a lot of crap. Eat a lot of crap. It's Jesus' birthday. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way to the gym with your big butt after New Year's Day. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun to be in debt. Later on you pay. Drink a lot of booze, drink a lot of booze, drink a lot of booze. Drink a lot of booze. It's Jesus' birthday, heart. The Herald Angels cry when they see the crap we buy. Peace on earth and mercy me. Too much cake, too much Chablis. Drink a lot of booze, eat a lot of crap, buy a lot of junk. It's Jesus' birthday, drink a lot of booze, eat a lot of crap, buy a lot of junk. It's Jesus' birthday, drink a lot of booze, eat a lot of crap, buy a lot of junk. Happy birthday to you.
to you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think the best, the best funny songs are those that are funny, but also have a true. Tr- truism under there. Sure. That was the main thing I learned in my improv date. Well, one of the main things from Del Close, which was truth and comedy. You know, the truth is actually funnier, although absurdity has its merits. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Honor, I want to thank you very much for uh, being my guest today. We'll thank you. you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, I want to thank uh, Honor for uh, being my guest from New York City. Okay, uh, Carla, another song. Another song. So do an old one or a new one? They're in the same key. Whatever you want to <laughs> do. Won't pick by key, <laughs> we'll pick out. We'll pick by old or new. I think I'll do a newer one for those who have already heard all my older stuff. This is from when I used to work in the mall. I had a job in the mall. And when you go outside, step outside the store, you're still inside. Mm-hmm. I felt like I was living in an aquarium. And the Cinnabon just starts to smell awful <laughs> after smelling it every day. So this is about that. Three or four times a day, my boss has to sneak away. And sometimes I hear him say, it's a tough road to hoe to be a nicotine slave. I'm not saying he's a jerk, but I have to do all the work. Acting manager, owner, and clerk While he's sitting in the sun Man, it drives me berserk It seems really clear to me Doesn't anybody else get the irony I've got to start smoking if I want to get a breath of fresh air With a secondhand smoking uproar He can't smoke out front anymore I thought he was absent before Now he's gotta get at least a hundred yards from the door He says he feels marginalized He's hoping to quit and he tries But if he gives up his favorite advice He'll also give up all of that regular exercise It seems really clear to me Doesn't anybody else get the irony I've gotta start smoking if I wanna get a breath of fresh air Can't beat them, join them, it's true but troublesome. I bought some cigarettes, they're made of bubble gum. Now I walk in the breeze and delight in the sun and pretend to ignite. It was all going more than all right, till the boss said, can I bomb a smoke and a light? Hey, what is this crap? Bubble gum on your break? You've got to be joking. Ulbrich, that's it. You are done. Wait, did I just get fired for not smoking? It seems really clear to me. Doesn't anybody else get the irony? I've got to start smoking if I want to get a breath of fresh air. Yeah, I better start smoking if I want to get some exercise. Well, I better start smoking. If I want to get a breath of fresh air. That's a great hook. I love that. <laughs> Thank <you. laughs> Thanks. Yeah, on the cigarette people always get like two or three breaks to go out in the uh-huh. fresh air. And yeah. Those of us who don't smoke have to stay in the store. <laughs> What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> I can I have a non smoking break? <laughs> I'll pretend I'm smoking. Yeah, that was when I was going to the bubblegum cigarette. <laughs> okay, um, the performing topic today is performing uh, humorous songs. And um, it just in, why don't we just start off in general, uh, like, what do you think about in terms of, like, when you're thinking about, I'm, I'm going to go out there and do these songs. And, do you do anything that maybe is a little different uh, than somebody doing more serious type of songs? Yes, I think so. I think with two things that just sprung to mind as you asked me that. The first thing is I think I am make more eye contact than someone who does serious songs. I'm really trying to make a connection. Mm-hmm. Without the connection, it's just not going to work. So 
I look at people, I see who's really engaged and engage back with them and and then that usually spreads and then you can grab everybody. Hopefully you grab everybody from the beginning, but if not, if you've got a tough crowd, you just find the people who are listening and you sing to them until everyone else comes in from whatever to-do list <laughs> or <laughs> texting or whatever they've been distracted right. by. It's, it, you know, it's an overstimulated world we live in. And then the other thing that I learned a long time ago from Andy Offit Irwin, who's more of a storyteller now. That really is his gift. He's a great storyteller. But he used to do concerts in, in the. He was in, he's in Atlanta or Covington technically, but the Atlanta area. And I was living down there for a year, right, like half a mile from Eddie's attic. Oh yeah. Where so much happened down there. And he taught me, I was in his band for a while. I played the tuba and the second guitar <laughs> and some harmonies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he taught me to ride the wave, which is if people are still laughing, don't jump back in with the next line until they, they're done laughing. Because if you jump back in too soon, first of all, they're gonna miss what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And second of all, you're training them to not laugh. So sometimes you have to sit on a cord for a few minutes right. or do a little lick or something. Mm -hmm. And that's not something you really have to worry about with serious songs. I mean, obviously you have to give people enough time to digest things. If you've just said something deep or profound and people need to ponder on it, then maybe you need to do a couple of bars of instrumental so that you're not forcing people to process things too fast. Right. But with funny songs, that's really an issue is giving people time to process it. One of the, I think, important things about performing that sometimes people don't really th think too much about is what you say between songs. And I, as I said, I saw you doing one of your videos. It was very funny that what you were just, it was stand-up comedy is what it was. And um, do you like ever uh, script that stuff or do you, how do you do mm -hmm. that? No, I do, I do craft the stuff before songs usually. Not so much today, we're just chatting. <laughs> <laughs> because you have questions. But normally I do ha I have a song and I ha try to think about the intro and craft it and make it funny. I do want to set up the song, but I don't want to like lose momentum by just babbling. Right. So I want to keep it at, keep everybody engaged. Mm -hmm. So yes, I do craft the stuff in between and some of the stuff is like stand up. It's like a joke and it has to be done right because if you screw up the setup then the punchline's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So some of it is you have a set list of jokes just the way you have a set list of songs uh -huh. and those jokes have to be done just like the song has to be done the way you wrote it or right. or it's not going to work. And I used to have the worst problem remembering, I still do, remembering other people's jokes and the funniest part, I used to get huge laughs from my friends try, because I'd be trying to tell a joke and I kept screwing it up. And so my screw up was funnier than that joke was ever, I'd be for 20 minutes trying to tell this complicated joke that I still can't remember mm -hmm. about some guy uh, hiding in a refrigerator or he was hanging off the balcony with his fingers or whatever. And it, it, it was such a complicated joke that, you know, obviously these people were having an affair and the husband comes home and I, and it is so complicated and then I kept telling her wrong. I'm like, no, no, wait, wait, I forgot to tell you that this happened first. No, before that happened. And so they were just, my friends were just cracking up at my butchering of this joke. It was way funnier than the joke. <laughs> so that I don't have such a problem remembering things that I wrote mm -hmm. because I usually write stuff from something either I lived through or I observed. Right. So, but trying to just remember, especially a complicated long joke is, I'm just not that, that good at remembering stuff that I didn't write. Same with songs. If I didn't write it, I, I can't. And like my friend Dan Hart, he knows something like 2,000 songs. He's got some weird... I know Dan. He is so underrated. I think he is so smart and funny. I haven't seen him in a number of years. And he, he's, in Bo he's back in Boston. He's moved around a lot. Okay. But he's also worked in mental health. Yes. Yeah. Really interesting guy. But he... 
has memorized, he's memorized something like 2,000 songs. Wow. He plays nursing homes a lot. Okay. And yeah, he he has like whatever you call it. I don't know if idetic is the right word, but he has a memory. You can hear a song once and mm, he's got yeah. it. He's the opposite of me, uh-huh. basically, is what I'm trying <laughs> to say. The well, anti Carla. <laughs> you were mentioning before about cer- certain topics you may not like politics, which I do anyway, but. In terms of like reading your audience, um, I think you have to be a little more aware of that maybe than other types of music. Yeah, a lot of people have like a test joke that's just a little bit political. <laughs> and then you see if, if you get a little, ooh, you're like, okay, I'll back away from that material. <laughs> but I'm from the South, so the South is very conservative and. I'm not. <laughs> and I just stay. I stay away from politics. Mm-hmm. Although, I was at a Folk Alliance conference in 2006 when Dick Cheney shot that guy in the face. Yeah. And somebody started a Dick Cheney shot a guy in the face song contest. That's fun. And I couldn't resist. I'm like, I have to be a part of this. <laughs> you know, I've got like 12 hours to write this song. Mm-hmm. And I was sitting at my booth where I was supposed to be promoting myself or whatever and I was like yeah just take whatever you want I was just working on on this song and I got second place but I didn't really care about the contest as much as I thought this is brilliant we should do this every year like just announce a topic in the middle of the conference because we got like 700 800 a thousand songwriters there yeah yeah. and it's just it was just a great idea I think they should do it every year and I that was about as political as I've gotten because I just couldn't I couldn't resist that topic. And I didn't have a third verse until the guy who got shot in the face came out and apologized for getting shot in the face. And I'm like, okay, I have my third <laughs> verse now. That is so ridiculous. I'm so sorry I got in the way of your shotgun. <laughs> well, I think it's time for another uh, song. Okay, well, I don't remember that one. I've <laughs> performed it probably all of once <laughs> at that conference. So let me think. I'll I'll do this one. This is this is about one of my favorite dining establishments. Not so much because of the food, but because of the ambiance. Waffle House. We don't have any up here. You got some in Pennsylvania, though. I've been there. I I lived in Atlanta area for oh, two, two years. That's where Waffle House started. I know, the oldest I know. Waffle House in the U.S. Every other corner. Yes, that's right. As I say, they've got three at every exit because it's the law. <laughs> And there's always a letter burned out in every sign. So this is about that. Let's see. How does this go? Yes. The guy who changes the light bulbs changes everything. He makes things as they once were. Security he brings. He's got power. He brings meaning. He sheds light on things. The guy who changes the light bulbs changes everything. See, Waffle House is Awful House without its W. And while you might agree with that, you'd fix it if it were you. And here's another problem for which there's no excuse. No H, no O, I don't know. What is Waffle Use? The guy who changes the light bulbs changes everything. When the guy at the Ramada has a boss who's a tight wad, we're left with Ram, or Ada, sometimes Ahmad, or Da, which is yes in Russia, or perhaps the sun god, Ra. Sometimes they just am. Sometimes mad is all they are. How about some French cuisine, you might ask your spouse, when up ahead you clearly see a sign that says, Le House. And whatever may befall me, may I never sink so low, is to have to give it up for food and become a waffle hoe. The guy who changes the light bulbs changes everything. So does the guy who every morning delivers your newspaper, the one who cleans the bathroom and refills the toilet paper, the priest who sits and listens to the sins of the confessor, and I just don't know where I'd be without my hairdresser. If you're feeling unimportant like you might as well go fishing, think back on those highway signs with several letters missing. 
Because the guy who changes the light bulbs is our most important job. When he's missing, how we miss him. Things get really odd. He's got power. He brings meaning. He's practically a god. The guy who changes the light bulbs is our most important job. And is he also the cook? That, the and cook. does he wash his hands after he changes the light bulb? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. I know when I worked at Pizza Hut, you had to like seat your own table. You were like hostess and you bust your own tables. And usually you were the dishwasher too because the dishwasher quit every three days. <laughs> and, you know, yeah, <laughs> multitasking. I, I delivered pizza at Pizza Hut. You did? One time, yeah. One time. Well, no, I mean... <laughs> I was employed by them for a couple months. Oh, yeah. And I didn't get robbed or anything. Well, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> you lived to tell the tale. I, I did. <laughs> um, talk a little bit about um, where people can buy your music, find out where you're playing, that type of thing. The easiest place to find everything is www.carlau.com. C-A-R-L-A-U.com. Don't even have to spell my last name. And it's not Carla University either, right? <laughs> no, I thought about starting a school, but there's so many politics, and I hate committee meetings. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, academia is, is it's too wrapped up in the money-making now, so I thought I'd keep it all about the education by not making it official. And they can buy your CDs through your... Yes, the uh, CD, you're right. Uh, <laughs> that is why you asked that. My CDs are all listed there, and my shows are all listed there, and... My bio is there, and there's some news there, and you can poke around. And oh, I, I did want to ask you, um, I know when Dr. Demento was living, uh, you had a couple of your songs he's on He's still internet. alive. Is he really? I yes. thought he had died. No. He's not, He's still doing a show on the internet. Oh, okay. He's just not on FM radio anymore. Oh, okay. He is alive and well, and he looks like my dad. Does he? It's a spooky resemblance. And, and now, do you, uh, when, are you still sending songs to him? Yes, absolutely. And he still plays me. Cool. And he was one of the first people to play me. So I was really, it put me on his basement tapes collection in, <laughs> in like 2000, I think, mm -hmm. with What If Your Girlfriend Was Gone. And then I got on his basement tape collection again in 2003 or four with What If Your Butt Was Gone. And I was like, what? Wait, that's the same song. Because I wrote a parody of my own song. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Only because only two times he put me on the compilation, it was the same song. But he's been really good to me. He plays me a lot, and he's really nice. Man, he's very smart. Yeah. He's a huge record collection of all novelty records, mm. and he's really a musicologist. He's like a walking encyclopedia of. I hope he has plans for who one day will inherit that gigantic, thorough, amazing record collection. I hope it goes to the Smithsonian or something. Wow. Because it's all you know, it's a lot of vinyl, a lot right. of rare records that you can't find mm -hmm. now and not not everything has been transferred to digital. Yeah. yeah. He's he's a really interesting guy. He's a California sir. Yes. Okay. I wanna talk about next show in okay. a couple of weeks. And then we'll come back and say goodbye type thing. Okay, um, our in-studio guest next week is Larry Ahern. You know Larry? I do not. Uh, Larry has spent a lot of time, he's a really good songwriter, but he spent a lot of time over the years um, in the business side of music. Um, he, he booked a number of venues, including the Main Point back in the 60s and 70s. I don't know if you know about the Main Point. I don't. It was the folk venue in the 60s and 70s. And, and also he booked music other places, and now he's doing some artist management. Uh, Craig Bickhart, you know Craig? He's from that. He originally, he was from Nashville, or he's from this area. Lived in Nashville, had a number of hit songs from other people did his songs. Um, so anyway, but Larry's also a good songwriter, and he'll be here, here okay. in a couple of weeks. I'll tune in and get schooled. And um, our, our Skype guest uh, is a guy named Jesse Terry. Who's from Connecticut, and uh, he is an internationally award-winning singer-songwriter. Uh, he was grand prize winner in the John Lennon competition, wow. which is pretty prestigious, I would yeah, say. Yeah, that's huge. And um, as well as a bunch of other song uh, 
contest. And uh, so I'm looking forward to that show as, as I am a, with every show. Fantastic. So, uh, Carla, I want to thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And um, I will, I'm will. i going to check out your, uh, your, of course, when this plays, it'll be over, but you're in concert window tonight. You have an mm -hmm. uh, online thing, so I'm going to watch that. And uh, I'll be first night in Morristown, which is okay. New Year's Eve. Mm -hmm. Great. So if you're in the Jersey area and you're planning on going to first night, it's a non-alcoholic, family-friendly event where they have a crazy Morristown is huge, like I don't know, thirty stages or twenty mm -hmm. stages or something. Wow! And if you're if you're clever, you can get to see four different shows if you, if you time it just right, mm -hmm. and you don't go, go and wind up standing in line for something that gets sold out. Right. If you're if you're clever and strategic, you can see four shows in one night for the price of whatever one button is. It's a really fun way to spend New Year's. Okay, sounds like it. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you again. Thank you very much, Carla. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, we'll be back in a couple weeks.